In this video, we're going to be buttoning up all the remaining issues with this old Toyota 4Runner and hopefully get it back to my dad so it can be used for this winter. So, what is it that still needs to be fixed on this? We just changed the head gaskets. What could really still be wrong? Well, let's go over to the bench and see what parts we have in store. A common issue for Toyota trucks and Toyota 4Runners is for the emergency brake or parking brake to become inoperable. And typically, the reason for that failure is because the parking brake bell cranks back by the drum brake on the rear axle become rusted solid and they can no longer articulate to engage the parking brake. So what I've done here is gone and bought a replacement hardware kit for the parking brake system for this 4Runner. Dorman makes them and it's really inexpensive. So right here we have the new bell crank parking brake assembly. It comes with all the pieces you need to overhaul the parking brake. This is only like $38. And then we have a new drum brake hardware kit which includes the springs and the pins and everything you should need to fully service a drum brake system. It's important to get this stuff because you gotta realize lots of rust and corrosion has happened back there. In fact, it's made the parking brake not work to begin with. So more than likely you won't be able to reuse any of the drum brake hardware that's in there. So here is that bell crank assembly I'm talking about. You can see this one is very rusted and you can just tell it's not going to articulate at all. So what happens when you pull the handbrake lever there by the steering wheel, it puts tension on this cable here. And when that cable pulls, it pulls this bell crank outward, which pushes the brake shoes against the drum. You see the passenger side has fared no better. And that's why your parking brake doesn't work. While parking brakes aren't critical on automatic transmission vehicles, they are very important on a manual transmission vehicle like this 4Runner. You can't just leave it idling without being in the vehicle and holding the brake or else it's just going to roll away. So it's very important that we get this fixed before it leaves the garage. Let's get on to it. Here is the bell crank from the passenger side, and I would say that's looking pretty frozen solid. So this is primarily what goes wrong, this hinge point right there. Rust starts to develop, and you might be able to free it up if you play with it long enough, but for $38, there's no point. You just replace it. The new kit does come with new rubber boots, so we'll just reassemble it as we see it here. Now, when I got in here, I wasn't really anticipating replacing the brake shoes. But I saw this and there is like maybe two or three millimeters left on that brake shoe. So I'm going to replace them. They're only like $25 from the local auto parts store. I'll just replace both sides. See how much thicker the brake material is on these new ones. So I'll just transfer over this adjuster here and put them on the new shoes and we'll get this thing put back together.
right, so that's one side now done. Drum brakes are just always really difficult to work on and you always have to take lots of pictures before you take it apart so you remember how it goes back together. Everything has a specific spot and goes back in a specific order. So you can see that now the parking brake lever works. I pull that, all these mechanisms now actuate. And it's pretty cool, as you pull it, it adjusts the little tumbler in here which pushes the shoes outward. So that tells you you can adjust the shoes to fit the size of the drum by just pulling the emergency brake a few times and it'll adjust itself. So that's pretty neat. All right, that's one side done. Let's do the other side. Go. the new parking brake bell cranks are put in and brand new drum brake shoes are installed so these brakes are going to work perfectly when I go and pull the hand brake go back to here you can't rotate these puppies at all the brake cable is nice and taut and these are now locked in place this is exactly what you need in a manual transmission vehicle. Now we're going to take on another project, one that I hadn't anticipated at the beginning of all of this, but ever since I installed these new leaf springs, they've begun to settle as this thing's just been sitting here in my garage, and it's gone back to basically the same ride height it was at before we started any of this to begin with. So you can see that right now, those leaf springs are kind of flattened out. It could be that that's just how these things ride, but I was wanting to raise the rear end. That was the whole point of putting these new leaf springs in. So I'm going to fix that once and for all. Let's go see how we're going to do it. Over here on the bench, what I have is called an add a leaf spring kit. So it comes in a pretty small box right here. This one's made by Pro Comp. It was only like $38. So I was like, let's do this. And what is in here are two leaf springs. And the idea is that you put these underneath the large leaf spring and above the overload spring and it kind of supports the entire leaf spring pack. So I added these to a pickup truck I had in the past and it really raised the rear end of it almost two inches. So this should do the trick. This should bring the back of the full runner up and keep it there. You can see that these come with little spring pads and it also comes with longer centering bolts because again the spring pack becomes taller and you need longer bolts to accommodate that. So unfortunately we're going to have to take apart the leaf springs again. We'll have to detach them from the axle and then pull out the centering bolt from the spring pack so we can slip these in but it should give us the result we're looking for. Let's get to it.
And with those springs installed, the Forerunner project is officially done. Look how much ride height that has given the rear end. That's what I was hoping for all along with the new leaf springs, and it just took that helper spring to really make it come to life. So as you can see, it has snowed, and we've got our first real proper snow of the year, about four inches. And I can't think of a better way to wrap up this project than take it for a spin, and possibly plop it into four wheel drive and go have some fun. And as a little bit of a bonus, we can see how this engine does with an actual real cold start, because it is oh, about 30 degrees. So we'll see what the cold start idle is at. And see how that adjusted idle control valve handles a complete engine warm up. how the emergency brake is actually holding it on the incline. Who would have thought? So cold start idle is a little over 1200 RPM making its way up to 1300 RPM. I think that's good, it's not too wild. All right, we're gonna see how two wheel drive does just going up a hill. It's not a super steep hill, but I mean, it is an incline. Uh oh. We're gonna have to test out four-wheel drive right now. Let me get out in the middle of the street. <laughs> Hold on. Put it in neutral. Put it into four high. I'll go turn the hubs because it is manual hubs. Old school. Manual locking hubs, best kind. Like a mountain goat. Look at that. Nothing stands in this thing's way. It is the perfect winter vehicle because it, it, you can't hurt it. I mean, it is not cosmetically perfect by any means, and mechanically, well now, mechanically, it is really strong. And that 4x4 classic Toyota truck drivetrain, purely mechanical, no electronic systems in it whatsoever. You really just can't fault it. love how these things pull through the snow. They will go wherever the wheels are pointed. The gearing's low enough so it never really gets bogged down in first or second gear. First gear is really low and then when you put this into four low, it is such a low gearing that you hardly move at all. So it's perfect for if you're stuck. This thing is fully warmed up and you see it's sitting at a perfect 800 rpm idle i'm so satisfied with that well there you have it 
Project Forerunner is complete.